entire moon is sometimes reflected in a single cup of water. One genom of the human body contains the code for the entire body. Sometimes, in the smallest prat, in the smallest detail and nuance, you have reflected the full picture. There is one Maimer Chazal, there is one statement in Medrash that describes the tragedy and then the triumph of Hanukkah. And commentators over the generations have struggled to understand the expression that the rabbis used when they wanted to describe what was going on during the time of Hanukkah. It's found a few places in Medrash. The first time is right in the beginning. Medrash Rabbah Bereshis on the Pasuk when it says, V'ha'aretz ha'isa soyu v'avoyu v'choshech al p'nei sahoyim v'ruach elekimer ha'chefes al p'nei ha'mayim The earth was engulfed in chaos and darkness over the abyss. And Chazal, the sages, see that verse as referring to the various empires that will dominate the world till Mashiach comes and often plunge the world into darkness. Chayshech refers to Malchus Yavon, the Greek empire. Why? Your first source says the Medrash Rabbi Bereshish Parsha Beis, Yavon Sheichada Vekala Begzei Yisrael. Greece, which was sharp and swift with its decrees upon the Jewish people. Ve'oymer lahem. The Greek empire, the Greek leaders would tell the Jewish people, Kisvu al keren ashoy she'ein lechem chelek belekei Yisrael. Write on the horn of the ox that you have no shear in the God of Israel. Belekei Yisrael. Write on the horn of the ox. Why on the horn of the ox? It's not the most comfortable place to write a message. I can understand write it on papyrus, on the paper they had then, the clay or other material used to inscribe, to engrave, to write. Write it on the horn of the ox. I once saw a Mephitish, a commentator, say that the horn of an ox was, us- was often used like we use today a baby bottle to feed babies, meaning this is what you should feed your children. It's still strange that the rabbis chose this expression as representing Malchus Yavon from everything they did, right on the horn of the ox. Let's learn a piece of Gemara in Masech the Shabbos. The sugya of Hanukkah, we all know that there's no tractate in Mishnah for Hanukkah. It's the one holiday that doesn't have its own tractate. But many of its laws are recorded in Masech the Shabbos in the second chapter your second source, Shabbos 21b. The rabbis learned, The Hanukkah candle, the mitzvah, is to place it by the door of your home, outdoors, outside. What if a person lived on the second floor? So they don't have, their door doesn't go outside, they have to go down the steps. But they, their door opens up to the hallway, going downstairs, their door baliyah on the second floor. Then you place the menorah by the window, which is open to the public domain, so even the people on the outside can appreciate it, not the window that's opened to the alley in the back, etc. In the time of danger... When it's dangerous to put the menorah outside, and it's dangerous to put the menorah by the window. For example, Jews are prohibited from lighting the menorah, so it's a time of danger. Then place the menorah on your table like we do with the Shabbos candles, and vidaya it is sufficient. So there's three options. The mitzvah is to place it by the door of your home outdoors. What does outdoors mean? So there's the Rashi, there's the Toysfis, does it mean outdoors? If you live by a courtyard, so you put it outside of your home by the courtyard, in the courtyard. Or does it mean even by the door of the courtyard, outside of Nishus Harabim, outside of the courtyard, actually in the public thoroughfare, but outside Mibachutz. Obviously, if the weather doesn't allow it, 
It would have to be placed. It would have to be protected by glass, etc. So it shouldn't go out, which, practically speaking, over the generations, as we know, Jews have tended to take the menorah from outside back to inside, which the Acharonim and the authorities discuss it at length, the Aruch HaShulchan, and many others, what happened. But that's the mitzvah outside. Option number two is by the window. Option number three is on your table. A few lines later, the Gemara says, in middle of the discussion of Hanukkah, and this is very strange, the Gemara is discussing Hanukkah before, the Gemara will continue discussing Hanukkah in a moment, and smack in the middle, the Gemara says, Amr Rav Kahana, Rav Kahana said, Darash Rav Nosen, Bar Minyumi Mishmei De Reb Tanchum. Rav Nosen, the son of Minyumi, said in the name of Reb Tanchum, Neir Shal Chanaka Sheni Chalamay Lamichaf Ama Psula Kesuka Kamavoi. If you place your Chanaka candles above 20 Amas, approximately 30 or 40 feet, so then you do not fulfill the mitzvah. It's possible like a sukkah and a mavi, just like by sukkah. We all know the first Mishnah Masech to sukkah. Sukkah she gvoya, l'may l'may esrim amma, if your schach is above 20 amas, 30 or 40 feet, depends how you define an amma. There's the shear of Reb Chaim Na, the shear of Chazaynish, different sizes, but let's assume between 30 and 40 feet approximately. So the schach, the sukkah is a disqualified sukkah, as the Gemara gives three reasons. The basic first reason is l'sholta b'yena, usually people don't look up so high, and therefore they will not be aware of the schach as much. The same is true with a mavui, when you have to make a beam in order to allow, you, uh, to allow yourself to carry on Shabbos, it can't be higher than 20 yamas. So Reb Kahana says in the name of Reb Tanchum, Chanukah Menorah has the same halacha, it can't be too high. Here is a strange insertion. Reb Kahana says another halacha. It says in Vayeshev, they throw Yosef into the pit, and the pit is empty without any water. You already said it's an empty pit. Obviously, there's no water. If it's empty, it's empty. When the Torah says it's a pit that's empty with no water, it means it's not just empty. It's empty with no water. There's no water in the pit, but there's something else in the pit. There were snakes and scorpions in the pit that they placed into Yosef. And the Gemara right away says, Amar Rab, Ner Chanukah mitzvah l'anicha betefach hasmucha l'pesach. When you put your Chanukah menorah outside, make sure it's still close to the door. Within, the, very close a tefach, a cubit close to the door of your home. Don't just put it outside, far away. Ve'hecha manach where should you put it? Rebacha barei derava amar. So Rebacha says, Mimin, put it on the right side. Put it on the right side of the door. Rebshmol medifti amar mismoil. Put it on the left. The halach is you put the Hanukkah can, the Hanukkah menorah on the left side of the door. Why? The mezuzah is on the right side of the door. When you enter into your home, the mezuzah, of course, is on the right as you're entering. So the Hanukkah menorah should be on the left side of the door, of course, outside, mibachutz, close to the home, but on the left side of the door. That's the halacha, ner Hanukkah mimin, ner mezuzah mimin, ner Hanukkah mesmail. Those who put the Hanukkah by the door, even inside, like today is the custom among most who don't put the Hanukkah menorah outside, literally outdoors, also put it on the left side, parallel to the mezuzah. Smack, and then the Gemara continues with Hanukkah. Smack in the middle, we have a drasha about Yosef's pit, not having water, and just snakes and scorpions. On one level, you could say, as Rashi points out, it's the same person. Rav Kahana says it, Rav Kahana, Rav Kahana quotes Rav Nosen, the son of Minyumi, in the name of Rav Tanchum. So because he made one statement about Hanukkah, about not being higher than 20 Amis, so we already quote a second statement, even though it's completely irrelevant, yet it's still somewhat strange that in smack in the middle of the whole discussion of Hanukkah, this comes in. It besides the fact that this statement is brought in other places. It didn't have to be brought only in Hanukkah. It's not like it would be forgotten from Jewish tradition. Which now brings us to another question. I understand the view of Rava that the Ner Hanukkah should be on the right side. You follow the mezuzah. The mezuzah is a biblical commandment. It's a mitzvah minatayr. 
Chanukah Menorah is obviously not a mitzvah in a It's an institution of the rabbis during the time of the second Beis Hamikdash. It's one of the mitzvahs medivrei sofer of the sages, right? The f- famous Gemara called Ma the Tiknu Rabbanan Kein Doi Raisa Tikon. As much as possible, the rabbis instituted their mitzvah similar to Torah mitzvahs. The mezuzah is clearly on the right side. So Ner Chanukah should also be on the right side. Why not? You have a mezuzah on the same side. You're coming into the door, the mezuzah is on the, on the right, or from your perspective on this side. So the Ner Chanukah is also on this side. Givaldik. The Gemara says, no, the halach is mismoil. It has to be on the left. Now, why is mezuzah on the right side? So the Gemara tells us, it says, Uchsaftam al mezuzah is beisecha uvisharecha. You have to write the parshius of Kriyashma al mezuzah is on the doorpost. In Kriyashma, beisecha of your home, uvisharecha, and your your gates, your portals. In other words, wherever you have an entrance coming in, to your home, your office, etc. So the Gemara says, Beisecha. It doesn't only say, Yabisharecha, it says also, Beisecha, which can also be read as, Biyascha, you're coming. Uchsafta al mezuzah is, Biyascha, meaning, you put a mezuzah only on one side, as Chazal learned out, not mezuzah is on both sides, mezuzah on one side. The question is, which side? So we say mezuzah is biyascha, the way, the side that you're coming in. Which side do you come in first from? So usually when a person, most people, which leg when you're walking? If I'm standing in front of my door and I'm going into the house, which leg do I lift up first to come in? So the ordinary person lifts up first the right leg. So who comes in first into the house, so to speak? I mean, it's not a big difference, but first, the right, not the left. In other words, I first enter the right side. So, you put it the way you come in, on the side that has precedence when you enter the house, and that is the right side. So it's clear mezuzah is on the right side. So, Rebach, in the name of Rav, says, you do the same thing. Comes up Shmuel Medifti and says, no, that's not the case. Why? The mezuzah is on the right, so this should be on the left. Why is that an explanation? The mezuzah is on the right, so I should put this also on the right. Just because the mezuzah is on the right, this should be on the left. There is a famous shalah. The shalah is an acronym of Shnei Luchas Habris. Shnei Luchas Habris that was authored by Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz, known as the Shalah HaKadosh, Rabbi of Prague, Frankfurt, and then Yerushalayim, buried in Tveria. The Shalah writes in Parshas Vayeshev and Miketz, in his Sefer Shnei Luchas Abris, that even though many of the holidays were instituted in later generations, and Kriyas HaTorah, the reading of the Torah, dates back to earlier times, to the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, Nonetheless, you can always find a very deep connection between the parshiyas of the week and the yamim toivim that coincide with those parshiyas. As he goes on to explain the thematic connection between Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, and Chanukah with a great ariches. Even though Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, the fact that they're read now at this time of the year might have been before Chanukah. Chanukah only happens in the beginning of Bayesheni, some 21, 2200 years ago, the Torah was written and Kriyasa Torah was instituted far earlier. Nonetheless, since Kriyasa Torah is a divine edict, so it includes by providence the history of Klal Yisrael, so it coincides with the holidays, not by coincidence, but there is a thematic relationship. Now there's no question that all the parshias from Vayeshev through Vayechi are dominated by one central theme. It's hard to say what is the central theme from Bareshev till Vayeshev. But from Vayeshev through Vayechi, there's no question that there's one central drama, if I could say, or narrative that pervades the second half of Sefer Bareshev, and that is the conflict between Yosef and his brothers. And its, and its ramifications, its results, and the whole evolution everything that occurs as a result of that conflict. His descent into Egypt, his becoming a viceroy, the hunger, their descent into Egypt, their ultimate meeting, the ultimate reconciliation, the relocation of the Jewish family into Mitzrayim, and ultimately the passing of Yaakov Avinu and of Yosef, which concludes Sefer Bereshis and a new book, Sefer Shmoy, Sefer Agul, as the Ramban puts it, opens up. The story of Yosef and his brothers, we addressed one aspect last week, but as much as you address it, 
it's still always perturbing. What really happened? What really happened? At the surface, when you're just reading Chumash without anything, it seems like Yosef is the pet. Yosef is beloved by his father. He loves him. He spoils him. He buys him. This, makes him this wonderful, multicolorful tunic. And the boys, the brothers, are jealous and they despise him. And then when he starts dreaming dreams, where he's not only getting special preferential treatment from his father, but he's dreaming that they are bowing down to him. Their sheaves are bowing down to his sheaves. And the sun and the moon and the 11 stars are bowing down to him. Now they hate him even more. Now they're jealous even more. When he speaks to their father bad about them, that only triggers the animosity, that only hasten, it only deepens the, the, the difficult relationship, the negative relationship. And then at a moment when they have an opportunity, they decide to kill him. Instead, they throw him into a pit and ultimately sell him into slavery. And the rest, as they say, is history. And in this case, it really, it really, it really is history. And yet, and yet, we're always perturbed what really, really happened. How did such a behavior take place? Under the clock of Yaakov Avinu, and by whom? By people who we don't consider to be lowly human beings. By the founding fathers of Klal Yisrael, by Shifte Yutke. How do we wrap our brain around it? But there's one particular pasuk I want to address today. And that is, Yosef approaches, Yosef approaches the, the, his brothers. Let's remember the story. They don't like Yosef. They're jealous of Yosef. They despise Yosef. The Torah says, Vayisnu Yosef. They hate Yosef, however you want to explain it. Yaakov one day turns to Yosef and says, your brothers are in Shechem. They're shepherding the flock. Let me send you to them to see what's going on. And Yosef says, Hineini. And he goes to Shechem. Now take a look in your source, a little down, Vayeshev, Perek, Lamed, Zion, Pasek, Yudches. They see him from far. And focus on these words. They see him from far. Before he comes close, they, they, uh, they plot to kill him. One man tells his brother, The master of the dreams is coming, the dreamer is coming. Let's kill him. We'll throw him into one of the pits and we'll say he was devoured by a wild beast and we shall see what happens, how his dreams materialize, the dreams that promised and predicted that we, we, we would all be subservient to him, we will all be prostrating ourselves to him, we and our mothers and our father, our mother and our father, etc. What happens in reality is, Reuven intervenes, as we all know, and he protests it. As the oldest boy, he says, no, let us not directly kill our brother. Instead, he, suppose, he suggests, let's throw him into a pit. Let's throw him in, not throw him into a pit after he's dead, as they suggested. Let's throw him into a pit initially. Let us not be the ones who directly kill our brother. That's Reuven's suggestion. He has in mind to save him. But this is what he tells them. He thinks this will be accepted. And indeed, it's accepted. They take Yosef. They strip him from his tunic, from his ksoyna's multicolorful coat that Yaakov made for him. And they throw him into the pit. When you read it every year, as we read it yesterday, it's hard not to emote again, not to emote again as that scene unfolds before our eyes. What do they do? They sit down to eat bread. They sit down to eat bread. Another strange phenomenon in the story. Now what happens is, Yishmaelim are going by. Yishmaelim Arabs are traveling. They're on the way from Gila to Mitzrayim. They're on the way to Egypt. So Yehuda speaks up in the middle of the meal. Let's listen to his words. Yehuda considered the king of the Shvatim, and Yaakov Avinu would say so at his deathbed, that he is the king and royalty will come from him. He is the king then already. Yehuda is the leader. We see throughout Bereshus, he is the one who ultimately uh, takes initiative at every moment of crisis, including this one. It will happen again and again and again including at the fateful moment when he will say he will become a slave instead of Binyamin later in Vayigash. So we already see, we can understand Yehuda's 
personality and power. So let's take a look at Yehuda's words. Vayeshev lamet zayin chavav. Vayoymer Yehuda alechav. It's right after the Gemara, the source after the Vayoymer Yehuda alechav. Yehuda said to his brothers, Ma betza ki nareg esachinu v'chisinu es dame. Ketz megeben on Chomesh, the blue, the blue, the blue safer. Yehuda says, Adank. Yehuda says, Ma betza. What profit is there if we kill our brother and cover his blood? The Maitik didn't do the next post. I just want to read the next one. Lamed Zayin Chavav. What does Mabetza mean? You know what Rashi says on Mabetza, right? From the Targum. Betza means what profit? What money is there? So Yehuda says, Mabetza. What profit is there that we kill our brother? In other words, we let him die in the pit and we cover his blood. In simple English, you would say, if I could be a little uh, brute, at least let's make some money off the deal. Let's sell him to the Yishmaelim. Let's not kill him. He's fart, our brother. His brothers listen to him. And that's what they do. The Midyanim come by, they take Yosef out of the pit. Who takes Yosef out of the pit? Whether it's the Midyanim or the Shvatim, is a big argument between most Mufarshim and the Rajabam. But whatever the case is, they take Yosef out of the pit and they sell him to the Yishmaelim. And we know exactly for how much, for Estrim Kesef, for 20 silver coins. It's not the greatest amount of money, but Yehuda says, Ma betza. What benefit, what profit is there in killing our brother? Let's sell him to the Yish. Me'elim. Now, even if we would not have any perspective on who Yehuda is, if somebody would tell you such a line coming from a brother about another brother, even if you really despise him and you're really jealous of him and ideologically you have very serious differences, it's hard to digest these words from Yehuda. In another context we would say they're very callous and callous in a very radical form, morally callous words. That's the, that's that's the cheshben here? Ma betza? There's no profit in this? There's really no benefit in this? He'll just be in the pit? At least let's sell him? Then he adds, Viadeinu al tihiboy. And we can't, we, then we could say we didn't kill him, we didn't leave him in a pit, we also sold him. That's the second calculation. Now, there's no question that this parsha, these parshiyos, have triggered over thousands of years enormous amounts of commentary all the way from the Medrash, down to Rishonim, to Achroinim, to Mekobolim, to Chachmei HaMusr, to Chachmei Achsidis, and Pshat, and Remez, and Endrush, and Soid, to understand the Mahalach here. No question, Shivim Ponim L'Torah, Torah has 70 faces. And all faces are true. The Arizal goes ahead and says that each Pasuk has 600,000 interpretations, paralleling each soul. 600,000 souls, each neshama has its own pirish and Torah. That's why Jews argue so much. Every mitzvah, every halacha, every, every story has 600,000 interpretations. I'm not sure yet there was a shear that covered 600,000 interpretations. I'm not sure there's a shear that covered 70 interpretations. Unique was the Megala Amukas. The Megala Amukas, the rabbi of Krakow, Reb Nosson Shapiro, who passed away in Tof 1640, Reb Nosson Shapiro on his Matseva, it says that it was known that he, Elio Anovi spoke to him face to face. That's engraved in the Matseva of the Megala Mukas. Megala Mukas means he reveals the depth. So he has a Sefer explaining the word Ve'eschanon in 252 ways. And 252 different ways. One word Ve'eschanon. And each way, I kid you not, each one of those ways that you explain Ve'eschanon, you could spend a few weeks on. 252 ways of Eschanan. And today we're going to learn actually his last way on Eschanan, number 252. He wrote another sefer, unfortunately it was lost, I think a thousand ways to on the word Vayikra. On the word Vayikra. He writes about it, that's how we know, but it was lost. And you could trust him. Megal Amukah says he made such a sefer, I think that was the number. He was unique. But generally, we take one face, we take one interpretation, and that's usually enough to challenge us, stimulate us, and make us think. So today, I want to discuss one mahalach. Last week, Parches Vayeshev, we discussed one perspective about Yosef and his brothers, the debate between two mahalchim, 
two Mahalchim in Yiddishkeit, Yosef, Yehuda, surrender versus self-expression, self-actualization versus self-transcendence, two paths in Judaism. Today we're going to discuss another perspective and then we will be able to see the connection to Hanukkah. Now this is going to be part one, although self-contained. Part two, Be'ezer Hashem, we're going to do Parshas Vayechi because this theme has a sequence. In order to understand this perspective, let's remember one introduction. And this is really introduced the first by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in the Kuzari, and later in the Sefer Akedas Yitzchak by the famous Spanish commentator Rabbi Yitzchak Arama in the Sefer Akedas Yitzchak. And he says there was a difference between Yaakov and his fathers. Avram had two sons, but Yishmael was expelled from the home and the legacy of the Abrahamic monotheistic tradition, the tradition of Yiddishkeit, so to speak, came through one, Yitzchak. As the Torah says, Ki bi Yitzchak yikari lechazar. Yitzchak has two sons, and one too carries the flag of Avram. And Yitzchak, Yaakov Avinu, Esav, decides to go his own way and ends up with a different tradition, a different lifestyle, and a different destiny. With Yaakov, the question is, will that happen again? The Akeda believes that the Shvatim were so suspicious of Yosef because they saw this pattern happening again. They were convinced that the love of Yaakov to Yosef is simply indicative of a similar pattern to what occurred by Avraham and what occurred by Yitzchak, which means they're all going to be ultimately sent away, if not geographically, but spiritually, existentially. And yet they knew that this is not true. And they were right. As the Gemara says in Psachim, Avraham yotzam imenu uh, Yishmal. Yitzchak yotzam imenu Esav. Yaakov mitosei shleima. His bed, his family is wholesome. In other words, shleima means all of them, all of them carry the flag of, of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, of Klal Yisrael, of Torah. But it's not simple because there's not one child. When you have Yitzchak and, 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 and Yaakov, you have one child. Here you have 12 sons, plus a daughter, or many daughters, that depends on different interpretations, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Nechemia, and different mothers. Avraham marries Sarah. Yitzchak marries Rivka. Hagar's child, Yishmael, goes in a different direction. But Yaakov marries Rachel, Leah, Bila, Zilpa, And they have different children, and Rachel and Leah are two very different sisters. We see it throughout. And that which we don't see is even more than that which we see. And as a result of that, there are legitimate and profound differences between the Mahalchim of Klal Yisrael, between the trends and the patterns that are set up in the first generation of the Jewish people between the siblings which didn't exist in previous generations. And although in the father you have encompassed all the patterns and all the themes because he is the father, and the father by definition is the progenitor, the source, like the seed, which contains the tree in all of its branches, but as the tree grows, there are different branches. And the different branches can then morph into many different, uh, many other branches, which all spring from the same source, but ultimately branch off, especially as a result of the influence of the mothers of Rachel and Leah. So within Yiddishkeit, we are privy to two paths that developed. And they were represented primarily by Yosef and Yehuda. Of course, not only Yehuda, Yehuda and his brothers, but Yehuda who represents in many ways the brothers. He is considered the Melech, the king. And he is the one who will stand up to Yosef again and again, especially at a fateful moment as mentioned earlier. He represents the other pattern. What was the debate between them? It was a great debate. How do I know it was such a great debate? Because it still rages in the Jewish world. 3,500 years later, the debate between Yehuda and Yosef still exists within the Jewish world in a powerful way. Maybe at this Shia we can make peace. But I don't want to be so audacious. But with your help, perhaps, you never know. Small people can sometimes accomplish great things. Last year we discussed one debate. Today we discuss another debate. The two are not disconnected, they're quite connected, but at least they're presented somewhat differently. And the big question is, 
What is really the aim of Judaism? <laughs> you know these types of questions? We have, we, many of us learn and go to shiurim and listen to shiurim. So many shiurim discuss details, right? You're learning a blat gemari, you're learning a perik mishnais, you're learning a parsha chumash, you're learning a mitzvah, you're learning a simon and shulchan aruch, you're learning a certain idea. So we discuss the certain details. But it's important also to be able to trace the details back to the klal. To be able to see in details the klal, the bigger picture. Yehuda and Yosef are arguing about something very fundamental about the very mission statement of Judaism, the very raison d'etre, the very objective goal and aim. What is Yiddishkeit? What is Torah? What is the question? The Shvatim, their vocation is Roy Yitzoyin, their shepherds. The Torah says so clearly, Yaakov says so clearly. The Targum Yonasim ben Uziel, the Shir Hashirim Zutah say, Yosef was not the Roy Yitzoyin. The others were all shepherds. Avram was a shepherd. Yitzchak was a shepherd. Yaakov was a shepherd. Yaakov was a shepherd for enormous amounts of years. And the brothers were all shepherds. Yosef helped them. So Chazal say he helped his brothers in shepherding the sheep. But the brothers, their vocation was shepherds. So this is a vocation, a work that the others and the Shvatim embraced. There was a reason for it. It wasn't the only available parnosa in the world. But there was a reason they embraced this vocation. And the reason is because the shepherd has a unique opportunity. The shepherd lives in seclusion from the hustle, from the vanities, from the noise, from the tumultuous reality of urban society. The shepherd communes with nature all day and night. The, the shepherd is surrounded by nature, by natural fields and farms and orchards, by the natural world that the Rabbi Nishalaylam created in close proximity to natural streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans, etc. And the shepherd has an opportunity really to be in a state of communion with nature and with the author of nature. A life of his boididus, a life of isolation. A life of intimacy with God, intimacy with spirituality. Yehuda believes, as the Pasuk in Tehillim says it very clearly, Hoiso Yehuda Lekotshoi, as we say in Hal. Yehuda believes that Yahadus, Yiddishkeit, demands from those who really want to carry its flag to be segregated from the world. Oilam, after all, the Gemara says in Psachim is Miloshin, Helen. The word Oilam means world, it also means. Lahalim, helem, halem yaalimu, concealment. In other words, by definition, the world is a place of concealment. What does it conceal? It conceals truth. It conceals the kaya chapoyel benifel. It conceals the divine vibrating life force, the inner consciousness, the l'shem yichud kuchabrichu shchinte, the inner godliness that is really at the core of all of reality, but the world conceals it. Hein am levodod yishkoim. The nation that is to be the Am Hashem must be shepherds. They must have an element of Badad. They must have an element of isolation for them to be able to be open and sensitive to spiritual consciousness, to godly consciousness, to a, uh, in Yiddish, a getliche bavustsein, a todae lokit. A godly sense of consciousness can only come in Heim Am Levodad Yishkoin. Shichichi Amei Chubeis Ovich, V'Yisav HaMelech Yofyech. Mekanish Tansen Av Alechasenes. The outside world, especially the urban world, especially the world of business, is filled with so much pressure, with so much secularism, with so many different trends. Even in those days of the Shvatim, maybe worse, maybe different, whatever it is. And the Shvatim, therefore, like the others, chose a vocation in which they can sing to God. They can be with Him. They can meditate. They can reflect. They can pray. They can learn. They can study. They lived in that spiritual perspective, that spiritual world, that spiritual universe. Yosef had a very different perspective. Yosef came along... And quoting Aleinu, who composed Aleinu? <laughs> you know who composed Aleinu? Yeshua Benun. Who was he a descendant from? 
Ephraim, who was a son of Yosef. So it fits well. Yosef, quoting Elenu, says the objective of Judaism is far more. Of course, the foundation of Judaism is that a person has a very serious and deep and intimate relationship with Hashem. A certain perspective on what life is and the purpose of life. But ultimately, the aim of Torah is l'sakein oilam b'malchus shindalad yut. To repair the whole world under the rulership of Hashem. Yakiru v'yedu kol yoyishvei sevel k'lechatich rekol berach. Let the entire world recognize its spiritual root in organic oneness. Or as we say in Rosh Hashanah, Meloich, we daven, Meloich ala oilam kuloi b'chvedecha. V'yeda kol pol kiyata p'yalte. V'yovin kol yitzur kiyata yitzarte. V'yoymar koil ha'shen neshama v'apoi Hashem elekei Yisrael melech. Umalchuse b'koil mashallah. Let every created being, not only human, ultimately recognize his or her or its relationship with you. Recognize that the world is one. There's an organic, inherent oneness that characterizes the world. Achtos Hashem, Hashem Echad in the entire universe. That's Yosef's vision. Yosef believes, as the Navi Yeshaya says, Amzu Yotzarti Li Tehilasi Yisaperu. I created this nation to betray to express my tehillah ultimately to the whole world, or as the same Navi says, Or Legoyim Nisatich, I made you a light unto the nations. This Sifarne writes, Rabbi Navadi Sifarne writes, What's Va'atem Tiuli Mamleches Koyanim Vegoy Kaddish? You shall be a kingdom of princes and a holy nation in Parshish Yisrael. So many interpret it, Goy Kaddish means aloof, unique. He says, Mamleches Koyanim, that ultimately you should become the ones who teach and inspire the whole world with the ideas, the basic Yisoides of Torah as the Rambam, a very interesting Rambam, in Hilchus Balach and Perek Zion, the Rambam writes, it's not a known Rambam, that Siva Moshe Rabbeinu Mepi Gvura, Moshe told the Jewish people from Har Sinai, from Hashem, that, every Jew is, that the Jewish people are responsible to influence the entire world every human being, to observe the Sheva Mitzvahs Bnei Noyach. The seven mitzvahs that were given to the children of Noyach is the responsibility of Jews to teach it to the whole world. Lakuf is called To compel, to influence, to force the world. That's what the Rambam says in Hilchus Malach and Perek Zayin. Now, of course, for much of Jewish history, this Rambam was not a very uh, <laughs> practical issue because we had a hard time enough. We had a hard time letting them just be us. Just let me live and let live. Just let me be a Jew. Imagine if the Jew would say, you know, part of my mission statement is I'm going to influence the world. Daya Litzara was, was hard enough for Jews to be Jews. In Yehuda and Yosef's days, and really many ways today, in which there's, we live in a different world in so many ways, the world of what we call modernity, the world of the 20th and 21st century, which in many ways is a very, very dangerous world, if you haven't realized yet, but also a world with unprecedented opportunity for the Jewish people, we come back to Yehuda and Yosef. So Yosef says, I don't agree. I don't agree. Of course, Olam is Melosh and Helen, but I believe that Judaism and the Jew has the power to ultimately infiltrate and influence and become the moral teacher and source of inspiration for the entire world. Yosef says that the whole world is really divine. And his great dream is, how am I going to impact it? How will I change it? Yosef Avinu declares, you don't have to run into isolation. Because really, deep down, despite the challenges, the whole world and all of humanity craves to place its mouth on the mouth of the Jew and declare together, Yizgada, V'yizgada Shmei Rabba. Yosef has a dream. He has a dream. And his dream is very different than his brother's dream. He also argues something else. He says, you know, my tired brother, it's very nice to develop your mahalach, your shita here. Your shepherds, you're in Hebron, you're in Shechem. And Hebron and Shechem was not what Hebron and Shechem are today, I assume. Although they were always action-filled places that we can clearly see. Some places, action has never ceased. The news never left Hebron, the news never left Shechem, the news never left Iraq, Bavel, for a single day. 
The question is if it's going to be Talmud Bavli or it's going to be other news coming from Iraq. But the new, the, some centers of the world where Gan Eden came from, some centers remain... Uh, I hope Muncie stays off the radar for a while. <coughs> Yosef says it's very nice at this stage of history we're together with Yaakov Avinu. Remember what it means to be together with Yaakov Avinu. We could afford this. But one day Jewish history may take a very dramatic turn. One day we may be living among other people. One day we may be forced out of our own cocoon, out of our own place, and we will be subjected to the forces of assimilation. And what are we going to do then? If our Yiddish guide is going to be based and founded only on the fact that we can be isolated, we can be living in a ghetto behind walls, and that's why we can carry on that tradition, the moment we're exposed and our children are exposed, whether we like it or we don't like it, we may lose it. We may assimilate. And therefore Yosef HaTzadik has a dream and he says, you have to learn how to be able to reveal Malchus Shamayim within the reality of the world. You have to be able to look at the world in all of its intense concealment and yet not only not get affected by it, not only not get turned off by it, not only not be overwhelmed by it and surrender to it, but rather you will be able to have the perspective, the confidence and the firmness that not only do you not become a victim, you become a leader, you become a source of influence, you become a source of inspiration. That's our, these are his dreams. Take a look at his dreams. They're listening. What are his dreams? His dreams is, we're all ma'am malum chasada. Then you have to understand agriculture is today's real estate. Agriculture, that was the source of the economy or one of the most important sources of the economy. And in agriculture, we're all making sheaves in the field. We all have bundles. But my sheave will stand up, and ultimately your sheaves will bow down to my sheaves. So Yosef wants to become a great leader in the world of economics, which is the ultimate of Gashmias. This is the center of the physical, vain society. That the Shvatim are so suspicious of. And what's his second dream? The sun, the moon, the 11 stars are all bowing down to me. Not only a leader in terms of economy and agriculture, even in terms of astronomy, science, physics, even more. The sun, the moon are directed by him. He wants to become the visionary light, like the light of the planets that illuminate the world. The source of light for the world. Yosef has a whole other dream. Yakiru v'yeidu kol Yosef v'yeseva. He wants to become Oyer Lagoyim, the Shemesh, the Yareich will all be guided by me. So you have agriculture, you have science, you have astronomy, and he wants to become the spiritual compass of the world. Now understand this, the Shvatim are listening to this, especially Yehuda. They can understand somebody has such a shita, such a philosophy, such a perspective. Integrate, go out, become a leader. In their mind, this constitutes the ultimate danger. There will not remain a sorid and a polit of Beis Yisrael. Isn't that the story of history? People integrate, and the next step is assimilation, and they're lost forever. No. Every family has the black sheep in the family. There's always the one kid, right, who gets thrown out of yeshiva at age 11, because either he was lighting smoke bombs, or because he opened a company already. Right? Every one of you has a sibling or a cousin. At age 11, he opened a company. The principal finds out. And Chad Gati sends him away. No, it's fine. They have such a brother. But suddenly they see Yisrael Oyavis Yosef Mikhail Bonov. He's the preferred brother. He's the king. They're all bowing down to him in his dreams. He is the future. And Yaakov believes it. Yaakov is in love with him. He makes him excited to pass him. In their mind, this is not just a questionable behavior. This guarantees the destruction of Yiddishkeit, the destruction of Torah, the demise of everything Avram, Avinu, and Yitzchak, and Yaakov sacrificed their life for, and went into fire for. And now it's all going to end. This is the ultimate cause of assimilation in Judaism. I'm a universalist. I want to be part of the world. Yehuda says, Gazru, 
Al pitom v'al yeinam. Al yeinam mishum al mishum b'noi sehem. There's no way the Jew will survive. There's no way monotheism will survive. There's no way Torah will survive. And the Shvatim see something else. We're not wrong. Let's look into the future. And here there's a fascinating medrash. I mentioned this before. Yosef had a descendant. Yeshua came from Yosef, but Yosef had another descendant from Ephraim. And this is the man whom we all know, the Pirkei says, Choyte Machti Yasharabim. He is the quintessential paradigm of the man who brought idolatry back to Judaism. He made a renaissance of Avodah in Eretz Yisrael. Yeruvim ben Nevot. Yeruvim, the son of Nevot, came from the tribe of Ephraim, from the descendants of Yosef. And he is the one who split away from the Malchus of David and Shloimeh. David was the first king of the Jewish people after Shaul. The first eternal king. His family is the family of Rodi. His son is Shloima. Shloima passes away. Rechavam takes over. He is the third king. And as I mentioned, there's a split. And who becomes the king in Lu or on the side of Rechavam? Yeravam ben Avat. And the Jewish people are split between ten tribes versus two tribes. And Yeravam ben Avat is the one who leads this split away from Malchus Yehuda into Malchus Yisrael. Now this was a decree from Achia Shiloini from Hashem. But what does he do with his position? He doesn't create one golden calf. He creates two golden calves in Don and Bethel. And ten tribes are now completely defined by a new pagan idolatry. He prohibits anybody going to Yerushalayim to the Beis HaMikdash. He changes Jewish life. And in fact, the southern, the northern kingdom as it's called, Malchus Yisrael versus Malchus Yehuda, for its most part is very affected by assimilationist trends. You can't compare it to Malchus Yehuda. Idolatry steeps into it. Who is it? Because of Yeravim. Says the Medrish. This is what the brothers told each other. Take a look in the source. Vayeshev lamed zayin yudches. Vayiru oisei meirachek. Uveterem yikrav aleim vayesnak lo oisei lahamisai. Ata lechuven aargeu zok de Medrish bereishis rabbe pei dalet. Vayomru isha lochev amar ablevi. Ze osid lahasiyam labaylam. You see this man? He is going to cause the Jewish people to go over to the idolatry Baal. That's what it means, Vayiru Oisai Meirachaik. They saw him from far. It doesn't only mean they saw him from far, from a distance. Vayiru Oisai Meirachaik, Zem Gahata Vaitin Kok. Vayiru Oisai Meirachaik. Today, Yosef is a 17 year old Geshmake Bacharol, steiging away in the bosom of Yaakov Avinu. But Meirachaik. His philosophy has what they say in Yiddish, Averemul Krichdarten. His philosophy is dangerous. His theology is going to cause a Yeravim ben is going to create assimilation among the Jewish people. Lechuven Argeyu. Let's, 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 let's nip it in the bud. When you kill it when it's small, we won't have problems. Mitosay Shleima. This is the danger for the Jewish people. L'chuven Argeyu. Let's kill him. You know the Maisa? They say there was a Yid from Chelem. So he decided to go to Varsha, to go to Warsaw, the big city. So he goes to Varsha, he goes to Warsaw, and it's a very muddy path. There's no paved roads. There's still barely paved roads. So he's walking in the grass, in the marsh, in the mud, and swamps. And then suddenly he sees what we would call railway tracks, but he didn't know what railway tracks is, but he saw some metal, some metal tracks, some metal bars on the ground. I'm a chaya, you could walk on them. So he starts walking on the tracks. Suddenly he hears a little squeak. So he turns around. He doesn't know if he sees somebody, he hears a little squeak. He continues walking, I'm a chaya, unperturbed, unbothered, and the squeak gets louder and louder. And he's walking and walking, and then suddenly he turns around and he sees this monster, this monster train coming right at him. And now the squeak is already. Adir v'chazak mashmiim kol. What does it do? Misnas him. It throws him off the ground. He goes flying. Lomas asrofim. So shengaven ameshapchim v'yoyimrim. He was almost killed and decimated immediately. He was thrown off Nebuch. He fell into a ditch. Fahakt, fa wounded, fa blodget, so blutigt, he's bleeding and maimed and wounded. Nebuchadnezzar sees him, so he takes him to his house. 
He gives him some clothes. He says, Let me warm up for you a, a cup of tea. So he takes the chaynik, the man takes the chaynik, the kettle, the old chaynik that your Baba had, puts it on the fire, puts in water, puts on the fire. A few minutes later, it starts squeaking. So this yid from Chalem takes a stick, goes over to the chaynik, he starts clopping, clopping. He shatters it into pieces. It's all over the kitchen. His host says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Mr. Hamashugana, what are you doing? He says, you have to get them when they're small. Because once the, they get big, they will destroy you. You got to get them when they're small. This is what they saw in Yosef HaTzadik. Now, take a look. Take a look. Who says this? Vayoimru Ishelachiv. Who says this? So we all know what a Chazal say Rashi brings? Shimon and Levi. Why Shimon and Levi? How'd they know it's Shimon and Levi? It's very simple. Who stood up for a similar perspective earlier in history? Parshas Vayishlach. Dina goes out to Shechem. Vatetzi Dina. She goes out. She goes out. The Be'er Mayim Chaim writes, the Be'er Mayim Chaim Chaynovitz writes, you know why she went out? Interesting. She went out to be Makarev, the people of Shechem. She went to open a Chabad house. <laughs> She's violated. She's kidnapped. She's contaminated. She's abducted. Shimon and Levi stand up for this. And they go. They kill Shechem. They kill the city. They take out Dina. People don't realize. They didn't just kill Shechem. Dina was kidnapped. When Shechem came to negotiate with Yaakov, he didn't bring Dina. Dina was kidnapped in the palace. She was a kidnapped girl. They went to get their sister. I think it's Dora Chaim who says that the city came to defend it's a very interesting that they came to defend Shechem because they were going to get Dina and it became a war. They killed them and it says after that they got Dina. Yaakov screams at them, Achar Moisi, you made me ugly. We will all be annihilated. And what do Shimon and Levi tell Yaakov? Four words. Hachizoyna yasas Are we going to allow our sister to be violated and contaminated and abducted in such a way? Yaakov doesn't answer. The Torah is so ambiguous. What was Yaakov was, who does, who does God agree with? And we know that in Parshas Vayechi, Yaakov will bring it up again right before he passes away. But that's a separate subject. Shimon and Levi were the ones who stood up for Achayseinu will not be a Zayna. They are the ones who say, Yosef, if Yosef prevails, there will be no Zecher. There will be no memory to Judaism. In fact, in fact, it's not a known Pasuk like most of Tanakh, but it's almost a clear Pasuk. The Novi Hosea, the prophet Hosea speaks about Ephraim, the son of Yosef, the Gzeda of Yeravim, and says, Hosea Zion Ches, Ephraim Ba'amim Hu Yizboilo. Ephraim will mix among the nations. In fact, today, what's the modern Hebrew word for assimilation? Where did they get the word from? Very good. You knew that before? Oh, okay. Ephraim ba'amim hu yizboilo. This is what Shimon said. I know what Isaiah is going to say. Hu <laughs> yizboilo. Let's nip it in the bud. Now come back to Yehuda. So Yehuda the king, come back to the Pasuk, What benefit is there in killing our brother? Yehuda is saying something very profound. And in a way, not callous at all. When somebody opposes you, there's another shitta here in Klal Yisrael. There's another shitta. When somebody opposes your shitta, by killing the person, do you really kill the shitta? 
No. You didn't allow it to happen. Ma betza. Will we be proven right if we kill our brother? We'll kill Yosef. We won't be proven right. You know what? Let's feed him the kasha he wants. Let's sell him to Mitzrayim. Zolazich direi in sufficient that something came up his soul. Evet kim in saloifen, vete kim in saloifen. Ich soga gut in Yiddish. Almost. We're getting there. We're getting there. Let's send him away. He, wa- he wants to drei the in the world. He wants to be the leader of economics. He wants to be the great scientist. He wants to be the great visionary. We're going to kill him. Killing somebody helps you win an argument. What do, they tell, what do the lawyers say? When your argument is weak, yell. When you don't have what to say, scream. You ever see when people start screaming? You know why? Because they have what to say. If you don't have what to say, you have to scream. When you have what to say, you don't have to scream. I guess I should scream less if I believe I have what to say, right? <laughs> right, one guy was once giving a she, he says, <laughs> That's called really internalizing what you're saying. Murdering Yosef will do the job. So we'll get rid of Yosef. That will prove us right and him wrong. It won't prove him wrong. We killed him when he was 17. Let's do something much deeper. Let's educate Yosef and let's see what God wants. Let Yosef go down to the Yishmaelim, to the Midyanim, to the Mitzrim. Let him see what's going on in the real world. The grass is so green there. There's great opportunity. Go there. You know what? He'll come to appreciate what Yaakov has. He'll come to appreciate his brothers. That's what Yosef says. Yodeinu al tehibay. What do we, ma betza. There's no, Yehuda says, ma betza. There's no benefit. There's no real profit. There's no real gain. By destroying something by force, you didn't show anybody what's right and wrong. You didn't educate. It's like when we coerce somebody. When we kill somebody. I don't only mean physically. There's no education here. You didn't enlighten. You didn't explain. You destroyed, you screamed, you shouted. But the question is still there, who's right? This is what Yehuda says. Now, somebody once asked me, is there humor in Chumash? Somebody once asked me, is there humor in davening? I said, of course. Talmidei chachamim marbim shalom ba'olam. But somebody asked me, is there humor in Chumash? The truth is, really, if there's humor in Chumash, the whole Chumash is based on humor. (laughs) Because the name of the first Jew is what? Yitzchak. What does Yitzchak mean? Agelechte. Lachen. Humor. A joke. It's funny that you would name your child Yitzchak. A joke. Who names their child that? We have to understand that. But humor is an essential part of Judaism, which is why Jews like humor. It also helped us survive a little. We we end with humor and we begin with Yitzchak, which is humor. But here, I want to show you that in one of the most humorous ironies in Sefer Bereshus, you have the contrast between Yehuda and Yosef. As always, the Torah is subtle. It's not explicit. It's not so blunt, although here it's close to blunt, but it shows you something very fascinating. And I have to give a little intro. We're talking here about Yehuda, we're talking about Yosef, and we have to remember that we're dealing with people whose greatness is beyond our comprehension. And yet, I want to use the stories at least as they apply to our lives. Yehuda is screaming, Ephraim ba'am yihu yizboilu. Yosef is the closest thing to Judaism. But ultimately... This can cause assimilation. The path to Yira Shemayim, the path to fear of God, remains in shepherding the flock. Isolation. Comes Parshas Vayeshev. Yehuda says, let's sell Yosef into assimilation and we'll see who's right. Is he right? Are we right? What will happen to him? What will happen to us? Will he realize his mistake? 
Will we, so, will we finally realize that we're truly right, not just based on insecurity, but we're really right? What's the next scene? The next scene changes the subject. Yehuda leaves his brothers. Why he leaves his brothers is a mystery. Rashi says, they sent him away from the family. They couldn't look at him. Unbelievable, extraordinary interpretation. There may be other, like always there's other interpretations. But Yehuda leaves. He leaves the family. He's shaken up. Yehuda is shaken up. Obviously he's shaken up. According to everybody, he's shaken up. Vayeret. He meets a woman. He gets married. He has three children. Eir, Oynan, and Shela. We all know the story. Eir dies. Oynan dies. Tamar wants to marry Shela. Yibum. Yehuda refuses. Tamar is in a desperate situation. She can, is not free to marry somebody else. Yehuda is not allowing her to marry Shela. He accuses her of killing his sons. And what happens next is, we all know, that Tamar hears that Yehuda is going to share his flock. Yehuda's wife passed away. What does she do? She covers her face with a cloak. Yehuda travels. He thinks she's a harlot. And he offers her relationships and the story continues. She becomes pregnant. He thinks his daughter is pregnant from somebody else. He finds out it's from her. However you explain the story, the Medrash struck, Hazal struggle with the story. It wasn't easy. Reuven, Reuven says himself, this is an embarrassing situation. He tells his friend, this is an embarrassing situation. Let's just leave the collateral with her. And then we go give him eternal credit that he confessed and said, me many, I did it. So Yehuda is traveling and he goes off to Tamar. He doesn't know who she is. That's Yehuda. What's the next scene? Yosef! is in a slave in the house of Potiphar. And the wife of Potiphar says, Sheikh imi. And what does Yosef do? Vayimoyin. He refuses. V'chatosi le'elikim. And the Gemara says in Saita Daf Lamed Vav, some of you just learned it a few days ago, right? The muz di yoikno yishal yakiv avivra b'chaloin. In Mitzrayim, in Ervasaritz, in the most depraved society and land of, the, of the world, in the world, as a slave, not owning himself, sold as a slave in the house of his master, Vayimoyin Yosef refuses to surrender his morality, to surrender his spirituality, to succumb to temptation. In the depth of a spiritual abyss, he can still see his father's image in a window. Is this not one of the most humorous ironies as the story of Sefer Bereshis develops? Because really, the Shvatim, the brothers, although their intention was noble and godly, made a mistake. They looked at the Ksoynes Pasim. What was the Ksoynes Pasim? Yisrael of Yosef Mikol Bonav. I want to ask you a question. The pasuk begins by Yeshiv Yaakov Beretz Megurei Yavif. The next pasuk, the Yisrael of Yosef Mikol Bonav. Why a change from Yaakov to Yisrael in one verse? Yisrael loved him, and what does it mean he loved him? Love in Bereshis doesn't mean I love you and I hate you. I love you and I don't love you. Love throughout Sefer Bereshis means I invest. My resources in you. I see that my most important task is to help you achieve your goal. The Yisrael of Yosef. So the Rokat Shavar gone. Rabbeinu Yosef Rosen. In Safnas Paneich Parshas Vayeshev says a Yisoit. Whenever it says Yaakov in Chumash, it's referring to the individual. Whenever it says Yisrael in Chumash, it's referring to Yaakov as a representative of Ummah Yisraelis. The Jewish nation as a whole. The Yisrael of us, Yosef Mikol Bonav. Yisrael represents the father, the future, the history of the Jewish people. Why? Because Yisrael sees that the Jewish people one day will go into exile. They will be mixed among all the nations. They will be minorities. And he understands that if we, they don't learn how to embrace the confidence, the depth, the sophistication, the deep 
relationship of Yehud, of Yosef, to be able to be in Egypt and sometimes to be involved in affairs connected to Mitzrayim and nonetheless remain on absolute Merkava, absolutely connected to Hashem under all circumstances. To be able to be in Egypt and yet to be able to see the Jews won't be able to survive. Like every other nation in the world, as long as they were in their own commonwealth, they survived. The moment they were exiled, never mind if there was persecution, immediately within a few generations they assimilated. They surrendered. It's too hard. The pressure is too overwhelming. For Yisrael, oh, this Yosef Mikolban. Yisrael, he understood this as the destiny of the Jewish people. What did he do for him? He did one thing. He made him a Ksoynes Pasim. What's a Ksoynes Pasim? A multicolorful tunic. What does that mean? This is a very deep gift. They weren't upset about a shirt that he gave them. Let them go to Century 21. There's good sales. And buy yourself a colorful shirt. You have to kill your brother because a sweater, because a cashmere sweater, because a mink coat. Feltes mink coats in New York. Feltes mink coats in Hebron. Maybe in Hebron. Go to the store and buy. Now is sale season, Black Friday. You can get a nice one. Colorful Friday. The Ksenis Pasim was much deeper. You see, Yehuda, we know, was saying something very real. What happens when you expose somebody to endless diversity? Most people or many people can't handle it. They get confused. They get overwhelmed. You'll take a Jew, you'll take a Jewish child, and you expose them to the big world in which there's so much going on. There's good, and there's evil, and there's darkness, and there's light, and there's a mixture of so many things, and so many ideas, philosophies, theologies, perspectives, behaviors, that are not conducive for one's physical and spiritual and emotional health. It becomes overwhelming practically, never mind philosophically. Black and white, in many ways, is a much easier path. Colorful, diversified, creates many challenges. Let's understand this. Many Jews have believed, good intentioned Jews, that the future of Judaism is for Jews to become completely integrated, completely aware of the outside world, on many levels, including philosophically, and often one will encounter by these Jews Terrible tension, even those who don't assimilate, but terrible tension. A few years ago, I read an article in the New York Times Magazine by a man named Noyach Feldman. Noyach Feldman learned in Maimonides School in Boston, Rambam, was founded by Rabbi Yosheh Ber Soloveitchik, Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik. He's a graduate of Maimonides. Today, he's a professor of economics in Harvard University. He wrote a long article titled, Orthodox Paradox. What's the thesis of his article? He, was growing, he grew up in the world, and they taught him, you can have both worlds. Meaning, as he put it, St. Paul and Slabotka, Abaya Virava, William Shakespeare. Both worlds. Secular culture and philosophy and music and Jewish. And he says, he says, from his perspective, it's a sham. And the whole article goes on to describe his struggles and he ultimately uh, married out and he brought her to a reunion in the yeshiva and they cut out her picture from the, from the whatever, I got some mice in the article, it's not for now. But he's touching on this. Don't confuse me. Either take me here or take me there. In fact, I would say sometimes you see people who really taste it from the Eitz Hadas and they may be religious, but one will often see it's hard for them to dance when they do a mitzvah. It's hard for some people to be enthusiastic with Yiddishkeit because even if I am still committed to Judaism on some level, but often my exposure tremendously to secular culture makes an impact on me in the sense that I can't be that excited about Yiddishkeit with pure innocence, with pure wholesomeness. It's more intellectual, it's more cold. It's hard for them to sing by davening, to dance by a mitzvah to really celebrate Yiddishkeit emotionally, holistically, soulfully, at least externally. For us, like Soinus Pasim, 
Yosef had a special gift from Yaakov. He made him a colorful tunic. What's the unique of colorful tunics? Diversity can overwhelm and destroy people. You're confused. You don't know who you are anymore. Verbistu. Verbistu. In your attempt to reconcile Shulchan Aruch with modernity. Ablat Gemara with a piece of secular literature. Jewish philosophy with secular philosophy. The inner world and the outer world. The Olam Agash and the Olam Aruchni. You sometimes don't even know who you are. Also, like Sinus Pasim, Yosef had a gift. What was the gift? The gift was to be able to find the unity in diversity. To be able to turn the colorfulness into a mosaic, into a tapestry. Because there are two approaches. One is the diversity destroys you, but if you have the gift of the Ksoynas Pasim, then you know how to reveal the unity in the diversity. You can discover the Echad within the diversity. You could see in the colorfulness of the world, ultimately, a mosaic, a tapestry that reflect oneness in various colors. But for that, you have to have a Ksoynas Pasim. Yaakov Avinu knew Yosef. He empowered him. He gave him the tools. He gave him the resources. Spiritually, practically, philosophically, concretely. The ability to be able to face a world of endless diversity, of contrasts, of paradoxes. And instead of losing himself in the paradoxes, instead of just surrendering, what can he do? He can ultimately reveal the unity the unity in it. In fact, take a look at one Pasuk. Vayigash memhei tes. Yosef sees his brothers. He reveals himself to his brother. What does he say? Maru v'alu elovi v'amartem elov koyam arbincha Yosef samani elohim lo adin l'chol mitzrayim. Go up to my father and tell him. Yosef said, Hashem made me a master on the whole Egypt. Rudoy, lie out, Tamit, come down, don't wait. Vigadatim lo obvious, kol kvoidi be Mitzrayim. Tell my father all my glory in Mitzrayim. He thought this will be a nachas settle. This will give nachas. Samani alekim lo adin alkal Mitzrayim. Tell your father that those geendik chas. Tell your father that you didn't stop putting on Rabbi Tam's tefillin. Tell your father that you were Nizer in Shmir Sabris. Kedusha say Nayim. Tell your father who you are. In fact, it says, Vayaris HaGolois. He saw the Egla roof of the famous Rashi, Vatechi Ruach Yaakov, he came to life. Tell my father, Samani Elekim Le'odin HaKol Eretz Mitzrayim. You know who I am? I'm the big boss in Mitzrayim. Taich the Chidush Harim. You don't understand the Pasik. Tell my father. Samani Elohi Kim Lodin Lachal Mitzrayim. Ich hab gemacht dem Eberstin an Odin of Mitzrayim. Samani Elohi Kim. I made Elohi Kim into a master of Mitzrayim. That's what I did here. It's easy to make Elohi Kim a master in Hebron in the base Medrash. I turned Elohi Kim Lodin Lachal Mitzrayim. The Ksoyinus Pasim allowed me to enter into the lion's den. And not only not to fall and not to forfeit my identity, not only to remain firm and etched and connected to my source, to my essence, to Hashem, but furthermore, so deeply, I made Hashem a master in Mitzrayim. Tell them, all my glory in Mitzrayim belongs to Avi. It belongs to my father. My father, my physical father, and my father in heaven. It belongs to my father. I never got lost in Mitzrayim. And that's why, that's why the Pasuk says, take a look, Vayeshev, Perek, Lamed, Zion, Pasuk, Yud, Gimel. Vayoyme Yisrael, El Yosef, Yisrael told Yosef. Again, suddenly, Yisrael. Remember this klal, Yisrael. Oi, your brothers are in Shechem. Let me send you to them. He said, I'm here. I ask you two questions. When Hashem told Avram, 
Why doesn't it say, Obviously, I'm talking to you, you're talking to me. That's the Chnish Tzadavant. Whenever it says, Who do you think he's talking to? His father's talking to him. He's answering. It's not like today, your father's talking to you, you're texting. So you have to say, He's not talking to the text, he's talking to his father. But then nobody was texting. Somebody had a conversation with you, you weren't texting him in the face. What's Vayoyma Vayoyme Ineni? Also, Yaakov says, Haloy Achech Oroyim B'Shchem, L'chav Esh L'chachem. What's Haloy? Oi, your brothers are in Shchem, let me send you. And if they weren't in Shchem, if they were in another city, Zog Debasayin. Reb Avram of Avruch, a student of Rabbi Yitzhak Barditshva, a student of Reb Nachman, Reb Matler, Reb Matler, Chernobyl, says that later went to Tzvas. Zog de Basayin, Bishchem, it's brought in Kabbalah, Bishchem is Rosh Hatevis, Baruch, Shem, Kvoid, Malchusay. Blessed is the name of the glory of his kingdom. What's missing in Bishchem? La'oilam vo'et. La'oilam means two things, forever and oilam in the world. Haloya chechoroyim b'shchem v'ayoyim Yisrael al-banav, not Yaakov. Again, this is Yisrael, the father of Jewish history, the one who looks further, distance. Your brothers, Yeroyim, they're shepherding b'shchem with Baruch Shem Kvoid Malchusay. L'chavesh l'chach alehem. It's time for me to send you to them. Jewish history is going to need your fortitude, your confidence. Vayoymer loy. What's loy? Liyoylam vaad. Vayoymer loy. He nani. I'm here. And therefore, the pasuk says, "Mikates." The next pasuk, "Mikates men beis ches vayakir Yosef asecha vahem loy kiru." Yosef recognizes his brothers; they don't recognize him. So Chazal say Rashi says the beard. He left them when he was seventeen. He didn't have a beard. The Balatanya says there's a much deeper interpretation. Vayakir Yosef es echa v'heim lo yikiru is not just the face. It's the whole story of the brothers. He recognized them. They never recognized him. V'heim lo yikiru, they didn't recognize him. You know why? They're looking at a man dressed in Egyptian clothing. On a shtraimu, on a bekeshe. Das is ayid. He's dressed in Egyptian clothing. He's running the superpower of the time. They didn't have the depth and the sensitivity to be able to see that godliness could be by Yosef in the midst of running the whole country. No one lifts a finger and he is the man running it. You can't sit in your home and run a superpower with a joystick. Maybe our president thinks so. <laughs> you can destroy ISIS with a joystick. We know it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, it would be nice. Yosef had to be there. The Shvatan didn't even know he knows Hebrew. They didn't have a hakara. They were great people, but they didn't have the soul that allowed them to be able to see this madrega, this state, that a person could be entrenched in Olam Haza, but he's really He's still absolutely one with Hashem, and to the contrary, he sees godliness in every moment. This is the story of Yosef in the house of Potiphar, in prison, at the helm of Egypt, Vayhi Hashem es Yosef, Shem Shamayim Shogur Befiv. Vayim Lohi Kiru. They never understood him. Certainly now they couldn't recognize him. Svasemis even says, Vayove Yosef as the Bosom Ra. Yosef said bad things about them. So the Svasemis writes, What's Pshat? Something, something very fascinating. He says, relative to him their holiness was seen on a very low level the bosom raw because relative to who he was 
as the expression in one of the Svarim is, that's an expression of the Balatanya. What for some people is an Aliyah is for another other person a Yerida. You know when Yehuda realized this? Oila Timnosa, Frek Rashi. Timna goes down. What does Rashi say? It's on a slope. One person is going down and the other person is going up. So where are you going? Depends. If you're up there, you're going down. If you're down here, you're going up. So what for one person is an aliyah, is for another person a yirida. That's a discovery. Because sometimes you're so trapped in your matzav, you don't even realize that. You're, con- you're, you're absolutely certain that you are the representation of God's will. And Yosef is the worst of the worst. And sometimes it's the other way around. You Pasha don't have the kalim to understand the revolutionary gift that the Reboiner Shaloylam through Yaakov Avinu gave Yosef to transform the whole world into a dear Eloyus Barak Betachtainim. The Kukstafem via Feld in a concert. You ever take a horse to a concert, to an opera? You ever did it? Take a horse to an opera. It doesn't have to be Mamasha horse, it could be something similar. The symphony finishes, not a symphony, I should say. Symphony finishes, and you turn to the Fed and you say, no, and he goes, <laughs> he gives a grunt. It's not his place. He doesn't have the chudshim for it. He sees everything in his paradigm. He doesn't understand. What for him is the sea of spirituality is for Yosef. Kinderspiel, this is a given. It's an obvious. He goes much deeper. You have to have the perspective. You have to have the eyes. You have to have the excitement. pass him. And we'll soon see in the next year, we'll see where Yehuda's philosophy comes into play in Jewish history because as an Ishkin Kinderspiel, this is Malchus based David, this is not a small thing. I would add, Chazal say Yosef accused his brothers in one special crime. What? Eivim Menachai. What's Eivim Menachai? You tear off a limb of a living animal. What does this really mean? They didn't know the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. Dina, Dina was violated. They kill out a whole city. Eivim Menachai, Sheva Mitzvah, basic Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. These are Yaakov's children. So the Shalah is mechadish, that it wasn't an animal, it was an animal they created through Sefi Yitzira. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, you created an animal through Sefi Yitzira. So there was a machloikas, if there's a din Everyone struggles with this. There's also a deeper interpretation. The whole world for Yosef is an Aver Menachai. The whole world is a limb of the Chai Elamim. And he was accusing his brothers that they want to separate the Aver Menachai. They don't have the ability to see that in every limb flows the soul, the neshama, koilan, koilan neshama, talal yutke. Rabbi Yosef, yeah. Say it good. Very good. Pasim, Rashi says, poitifar soicharim yishma'elim idyonim. This is a gift you give your child. Let me give you a gift. Poitifar soicharim yishma'elim idyonim. You want to give me a gift? This is a gift. He was giving him a gift. You're going to be by Paitifa, you're going to be by the Seicherim, you're going to be by the Ishmaelim, you're going to be by Minyanim, but you will always be cradled in the arms of Hashem. You will always be in a place of oneness. You'll be in the world, and yet you'll remain above. Not because you're not in. You're in. You're really in. You're not detached. You're not aloof, sublime. You're in, but you remain transcendent. Now, let's go to Hanukkah. And this is all indicated in the sources, in the source we discussed right in the beginning of the class. The Chazal said this whole Shir in two words. The Yevonim said, Kisvu lachem al keren hashoyr she'en lachem chelik 
on the horn of the axe, I want you to deny your relationship with Hashem. Al Karen Hashoy. But here is the whole story. In Parshas Miketz, Yosef tells his brothers, he tells the people in his home, my brothers are here. Tvoyach, Tevach, Vahachin. Slaughter a meal and prepare. Say this for him, some cipher, ready before some cipher. Tvoyach, Tevach, Vahachin. So Tevach, Vahachin. The last letter of Tevach is Ches. Vahachin is Vav. Hey, Chaf, Nun. What do you have? Chanukah. Tvoyach, Tevach, Vahachin. Tvoyach, Tevach is also 44. Chanukah. If you count the candles with the Shamash, you have 44. Why is Yosef referring to Hanukkah? What's the point? But essentially, this is exactly what happened at Hanukkah. The Greeks weren't outraged by Judaism completely. They were the ones who translated the Torah. The Gemara says in Tainis, Talmi HaMelech translated the Torah into Yavonis. We still have it. It's called Septuagint. Targum Hashivim. Septuagint is the Targum. He took 70 skenim, 70 elders. And he put them away in private rooms. And he had them translate the whole Torah into the Greek language. Because the Greeks celebrated culture, diversity, wisdom. Tremendously. They introduced tremendous contributions to civilization. Drama. History, architecture, art, athleticism, many that still impact the world. Not only the Olympics, that too. Not only sports competitions, that too. And their contributions were incredibly powerful. And that's why they had such an appeal to the Jewish people, because they were not brute barbarians. They had some very barbaric elements to them. They believe that every disabled child or any child that is not fully healthy should be immediately killed. People who are older should be placed on a mountain. And I mean, many other things. They believed, Aristotle believed in pedophilia as a way of life. Spartan lifestyle is unique in its barbaric components. But there was an element of culture that was very rich, that was very powerful. Yavon is the same letters like Noi, beauty. In fact, Yavon comes from Yefes in Parshas Noyach, which means beauty. The Gemara says, the Pasuk Noyach says, Yafta lekim le Yefes v'yishkan ba'alei shem. Hashem makes Yefes beautiful. Let it dwell. Yof yofuso shal Yefes ba'alei shem. And that's why the Mishnah says, Lo hitiru letagim esatoyre elo. Lichtav esatoyre elo Yavonis. The language of Yavon had a special prominence among the rabbis because Yof yofuso shal Yefes ba'alei shem. There was something unique and prominent about their language, about their writing. And yet, the time of Hanukkah, they came, and they wanted the Jewish people to assimilate. What was their argument? Kisvul lachem al keren The horn of the ox. Oy, was this a sophisticated argument. Who is the horn of the ox? Who is the horn of the ox? Take a look. Moshe Rabbeinu, his last... Blessings to the Jewish people. Oli Yosei Famar, Pchoy Shoyroi Hador Loi Vekarnerem Karnov, the oldest of Rachel's children. His beauty is the beauty of a Shoy, and his horns are the horns of a Reim of the wild bull, the wild Shoy. Yo- Yaakov too on his deathbed speaks about Yosef when he says to Shimon and Levi, Ki ba'apam hargu ish ubirtsoinam ikru. Shoir. They uprooted an ox. We're not your enemies. We're continue, we continue the tradition of Yosef. Look at Yosef. Yosef is the entrepreneur of Judaism. Yosef is not secluded. Yosef is beautiful. Yosef hangs out by Paitifar. He runs the show. He runs the country. He's the superpower of Egypt. He's dressed. He knows the language. Yosef knows 70 languages, the Gemara says. We're Yosef's people. Keren Hashar, we just want, you should have the beauty. Rashi says, There's no, no, no horns that are more beautiful. Karnirem Karnov. 
But what do they really want? Ein lechem chelik belekei Yisrael. They want to use Yosef as their justification. That you don't need to have a part in Elikei Yisrael. Isn't this what Shimon and Levi said to each other? They said, This is going to be your oven benavot. The golden calves. This is Yosef. This is what the Yavanim come along and say. And you want to hear something? The Megal Amukah says, What's the gematria of Yosef? Antiochus. What's the gematria of Yosef? Melech Yavan. You could make a count. Antiochus, Melech Yavan. This is what the Shvatim said. This is the danger of Yosef. Antiochus, Melech Yavan. Keren Asher Shein Lechem Chelek Belekei Yisrael. The truth is that they distorted Yosef. They completely misunderstood Yosef. Because Yosef's determination to reach out and change the world was not born out of, out of inferiority complex because of a desire to assimilate because he lacked an unyielding commitment to the faith of his fathers, because he was insecure, because he needed the world to make him feel good about himself, to make him feel like a mensch. That wasn't Yosef, it was the opposite. He was determined to transform the world, not to let the world transform him, to bring the light of Torah to the world, to introduce the oneness of Hashem into the world, because he was so deeply confident in his faith. Because he was so connected to his faith. He was not afraid to enter into the mansions of Egypt. Speak its language. Run its economy. And maintain his dedication to Torah. In fact, he calls himself Ivri throughout. And the Medrash says, he was taken into Eretz Yisrael, not Moshe. Why? Medrash Abaves Hanan. Hashem said, he calls himself a Ivri everywhere. In prison, by Paray, by Potiphar. And Moshe, when he runs away to Midian, what do they say? Ish Mitzri Hitzilano. He says, Yosef was in Egypt, but he called himself an Ivri. He comes back to Eretz Yisrael. Imagine. Yosef, even relative to Moshe, however you understand it. Medrash Abba Parshas Vazchana. And when his brothers come into Mitzrayim, what are his first words to them? Miraglim Atem. You are the spies. It says in Kabbalah that the ten spies that Moshe sent, besides Yeshua and Kalev, were reincarnations of the Shvatim. Miraglim Atem, your spies. What was the mistake of the spies? Why didn't the spies want to go into Eretz Yisrael? Not for the same reason. They wanted to remain in the desert. Why? In the desert. That's a place of Dvekas. You're going to go into Eretz Yisrael? You're going to have to build a government, an army, politics, become far... You're going to have to run a show. It's going to be a churban. Eretz, oi cheles, oi shmeo. Yosef looked at his voice and said, Meraglim atem, you have the shit of the Meraglim. I'm ready to go into Eretz Yisrael, not because I'm not confident, because I am confident. So in Egypt, he calls himself Ish Ivri. The Yivonim distort Yosef. Ein lechem chelik belekei Yisrael. That's Yosef. He, does he doesn't need elekei Yisrael. Who stands up to the Greeks? The same person who stood up for Dina. The same person who stood up to Yosef. Who? Which tribe? Levi. Moshe says about Levi, The Chasidech, the same tribe who stood up when they made the first golden calf. Moshe said, Mila Hashem Eli. And who came to him? Kol Bnei Levi. Levi, Ish Chasidecha, stands up. Levi's fought against the eagle, fought against Yeravam, and now is ready to fight against Yavon. And they declare war against this philosophy that wants to destroy the integrity, the sacredness of Kedushas Yisrael, Kedushas HaToyre, Kedushas HaOma. What do we say in the Nagunam of Hanukkah tonight? Pirzu. From all the things they did, they breached the wall. They wanted to remove the wall, eliminate the chayma. Chazal say they made 13 breaches. Yud Gimel Pirzes they made in the chayma, entering in the Beis Hamikdash. They made a statue of Zeus in the temple in the Beis Hamikdash. What was the miracle of Chanukah? Zog the Gemara in Shabbos, Matzu Pach Echot Shel Shemen Shahayachasum Bechaysamay Shel Kain Gadol. 
They found that jug of oil that was self-contained, isolated, sealed. Because Sama Shalkai and wasn't affected by the openness of the Greeks, by the contamination of the Greeks. That's what they found. Levi was victorious. Levi reclaimed. He saved. He extracted Yosef from the claws of the Yavanim. Yosef is Nishkin Antiochus. Yosef is Nishkin Melech Yavan. The Shoyer of Yosef says, Yesh li chelek belike Yisrael. Not ein li chelek chas v'shalom belike Yisrael. Why oil? What's the quality of oil, Rabbi Yisrael? What's the quality of oil? You take a cup, put an orange juice and grape juice and celery juice and fruit juice. Put even mango juice. And if you want, add some ginger and celery juice. The juicers. And then put in a little oil, just to give you a little cow, a little fat, fart. Epis, Ahemashayid needs oil in everything. But what's going to happen with the oil? Enoi Misarev. Tzof Lamayla Chazal say. Always stays above. Levi says, Pach Echot Shal Shemen. Yosef was always Shemen. Don't confuse him. He never got mixed. He never assimilated. He's not Ein Lechem Chelek Belekei Yisrael. Yosef wants to change the world, not be changed by the world. Yosef is Ata Echad V'Shimcha Echad. But mi chamcha ki Yisrael go echad ba'aretz. Ata echad, you're one. V'shimcha, even your name is one, your reflection. But then there's go echad ba'aretz. The ability to reveal echad ba'aretz. O mi chamcha Yisrael. That was the gift of Yisrael to Yosef to be able to reveal echad ba'aretz. That's the shemen. That's one side of Hanukkah. But now take the other side of Hanukkah. What's the other side of Hanukkah? We learn the Gemara. Mitzvah lahanicha al Pesach beisoi. Mi pachutz. On the outside. How many candles? Why on the outside? Pesumi nisa. You got to light up the outside. Comes the Chidush Urim and says, that's why. Mezuzah mimin v'nei Hanukkah mesmoil. So we ask the question. Mezuzah is on the right. Hanukkah should also be on the right. The answer is, Hanukkah is on the right. Hanukkah is not on the left. You look at me, if I say it's on the right, it is on the right. It just depends on perspective. By mezuzah, what are you focusing in? Going in. When you're going in, what's your right? Your right leg goes in, it's on the right. By Hanukkah, what's your objective? You want to go out. You want to reveal the Yosef's Mahalach to reveal the Kedusha outside. You do it, of course you do it on the right. Which leg goes out first? The right, when you're going out. It's on the right, it's on the left of mezuzah. That's why the Gemara comes in there. That's why Yosef comes into Hanukkah. They throw him into a pit with snakes and scorpions. They're telling Yosef, you want to go to the snakes and scorpions? Go to the snakes and scorpions. Ma betza. Go to the snakes and scorpions. But what happens? Yosef emerges from the snakes. He emerges from the scorpions. And he's the king. The Yosef, who hamashbir bar, who hashalit al who hamashbir. He is the one who feeds Klal Yisrael. He gives them the food. He becomes the king at that stage in history. He teaches them what it means to be a Jew in the world. How many candles do you light on Hanukkah without the shamish? 36. Loi li vayed. You remember, Vayoimer loy hineini. That's Yosef, loy li That's why the Gemara says it's a mitzvah to put it outside. And even if you live baaliyah, what does it mean if you live baaliyah? Zok de kajnet samagad and avoid this Yisrael. There's a ben aliyah. There's a person who says, I'm a high man. Ich bin a ben aliyah. I'm lofty, I'm spiritual. I can't go outside. Don't think you're exempt. Put it by the window. Even you have a responsibility to illuminate the world. If it's a danger, then go to the table. Yehuda said it's Shasa Sakana. This whole world is in Grace Sakana. The minority stays on the table. Don't go to the window. But Hanukkah is the victory of oneness. Levi himself says he put the candle outside. And that's why the Gemara says. If it's higher than 20 amas, it's not good. Why? What's the next piece of Gemara? 
they threw Yosef into a pit of scorpions. What's the connection? Yosef said, take the menorah down from 20 Amis. Pursuming is there. They said, you're going to the snakes. That's the Gemara. What's the next piece in Gemara? You have to light it outside. But one condition. Tefach hasamach labayas. Always remain connected to your house. Don't run outside and not remain connected to your house. He always remained connected to his home. We shall see in the next year, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, next Sunday I'm not here, how these two trends follow the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael, in the Mishkan Shiloh versus the Beis HaMikdash, and where the two Mahalachim come together in Jewish history. Have a wonderful week. Unafreilichin, unlichtikin, unlustikin, chanakin.